In 2018, Sony released the animated masterpiece, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And I think for most people, the initial feeling when this was announced was skepticism. And for good reason, too. This was the seventh theatrical Spider-Man film to be released, and was coming on the heels of Sony relinquishing the use of live-action Spidey to the MCU. It would have been really easy to look at this new Spider-Man film cynically, as Sony's attempt to capitalize further on the character while they split revenue from the live-action franchise with Disney. But I think a lot of that skepticism skepticism lifted when the first teaser trailer dropped, about a year before the film's release, showcasing some of the most iconic imagery in the film, its incredibly unique visual style, and giving us our first real look at its protagonist, Miles Morales. It was very clear that this Spider-Man was doing things differently, and when the film eventually did release in December 2018, there was zero skepticism remaining, because not only did Into the Spider-Verse prove to be a bold and new direction for the franchise, it did so as a massive and unmatched celebration of all things Spider-Man. So let's talk about this monumental achievement in both animation and superhero films, because five years later, Into the Spider-Verse is still perfect. Look, I could go on forever about the visuals of Into the Spider-Verse, and many have, so I'm not gonna make this too long. It's obvious that it's one of the best looking 3D animated films of all time. Avoiding the all too common photorealism we've come to expect from other studios, and instead fully embracing its comic book origins, which in itself feels like such an obvious thing to do. Why would we be looking to animated films for photorealism? We know it isn't real, so showcase visuals that you cannot showcase in a live action format. Make the textures of the backgrounds and characters look like they feature the types of print lines and the Ben Day dots that comic books are known for. Use comic book panels, thought bubbles, showcase the visuals you see in comic books like the iconic Spidey Sense squiggles. Fully pay homage to the medium that you are translating to the big screen. And this film is a celebration of comic books, and it's a celebration of Spider-Man. Not only his comic book history, but his big screen history too, which is clear from this opening sequence where Spidey himself gives the introduction. All right, let's do this one last time. Even these simple words, let's do this one last time, are in reference to the countless Spider-Man origin stories we've seen across so many mediums, as Chris Pine's Peter Parker delivers the highlights of his entire career, alluding to many moments we know and love throughout Spidey's history. Great power, Uncle Ben's death, scenes we recognize from the previous films, some with some slight twists, and of course, the iconic Spider-Man 3 dance sequence. But it also sets up this version of Spider-Man incredibly well, and establishes the most important part of his short short-lived arc in the film, that no matter how many hits he takes, I always find a way to come back. I'm telling you, remember that. And then we are introduced to Miles Morales, our main character. Miles was first introduced in the comics back in 2011 in the Ultimates comic line, created by Brian Michael Bendis in order to succeed Spidey after his death in that universe. I am a big fan of Miles in the comics, but this film manages to improve on Miles' character and origins in almost every single way. In the comics, in true Spider-Man fashion, Miles has an absolutely tragic life. After he becomes Spider-Man, his father abandons him, his mother is killed by Venom, and his uncle tries to manipulate and blackmail him, using his powers for his own criminal needs. This film takes major aspects of all of these characters, but hones in on the familial themes, tying them directly to Miles' eventual journey and arc in becoming Spider-Man. They immediately establish Miles' parents, Rio and Jeff, and their love for their son, but also quickly establish that Miles and his father are not always on the same page, as Jeff chastises Miles for sticking street art stickers around Brooklyn. And brilliantly, they make street art Miles' major connection to his uncle Aaron, who has drifted apart from his brother, Miles' dad, over the years. The webs woven in these characters' familiar relationships are absolutely key in their arcs and story, and for the themes at large as well. The entire sequence perfectly demonstrates how out of sync Miles and Jeff are, despite their clear care for one another. Is that a coffee shop or a disco? <laughs> Nine year old. Miles wants to walk to school, Jeff forces him to take the ride. Not caring about how he might embarrass his son at his brand new school, Jeff has a habit of forcing his own wants and desires for Miles onto him, perfectly illustrated by their I love you exchange. As Miles Miles walks into school, Jeff tells Miles he loves him, and over his loudspeaker, forces his son to publicly say he loves him back, further embarrassing him and not letting Miles live his life on his own terms. Their conversation in the car also showcases a major aspect of Miles' insecurities. He struggles with the great expectations foisted upon him having gotten into this fancy new school. I'm only here because I won that stupid lottery. No way. You passed the entry test just like everybody else. He'd rather exist comfortably in his old school than rise to the opportunity presented for him. The expectation 
friends scare him, further showcased as he tries to purposely flunk out of his classes, but in the process accidentally proves that he is smart enough to excel in this environment. It's not really about his abilities, it's about the pressure of those great expectations. And this is why rather than unpacking his own insecurities about these expectations in his paper, he bails on school to hang out with someone who gets him, Uncle Aaron. Somebody who understands what Miles' passions are and encourages him to pursue them, even if they conflict with his responsibilities. And it's so clear from their rapport that Miles and Aaron just get each other. They have fun, Aaron gives Miles advice about girls, he brings him somewhere where he can safely tag some of his new art without his dad finding out, which is again a huge juxtaposition to his relationship with his father. Miles is afraid to pursue his passions, the things he's good at, because he fears how his father would react. He knows his dad disapproves. And this is exactly Miles' big roadblock in his journey to become Spider-Man as well. After Miles is bitten by the spider, begins to develop his abilities, and realizes what's happening to him, he starts to panic and look for help. Of course, the first person he calls is Aaron, who's out of town. And in a heartbreaking moment later, he starts to call his dad before hanging up the phone. He knows his dad is not a fan of Spider-Man, and he fears how his father would react if Miles told him what was going on with him. And so, this is one of the major things holding Miles back mentally. Miles does have a brief glimmer of hope that someone will guide him through this when he stumbles on Spider-Man fighting Green Goblin, and Spidey realizes that Miles is like him. I can help you. If you, if you stick around, I can show you the ropes. This hope is short-lived as Peter is mortally wounded when the Super Collider explodes, and unfortunately, this puts a ton of additional pressure on Miles, who Peter asks to destroy the Collider in his absence, now without anyone to guide him. Slight tangent, Chris Pine does not get enough credit for his brief but excellent performance as Peter Parker in this movie, which is sadly most brilliantly showcased as he's dying. I know what you're trying to do, and it won't work. They're gone. After Miles gets home, realizing he has to take up this great responsibility to become Spider-Man and stop Kingpin, he meekly asks his father an important question. Dad? Yeah. It's, you really hate Spider-Man? Miles' obligation to become Spider-Man, to save everybody he loves, is in direct conflict with his father, a conflict he already struggles with in his everyday life. And this transitions into what is probably my favorite sequence in the film, as news breaks that Spider-Man has died. Not even Jeff, who just told Miles that he hates Spider-Man, can stop himself from bringing his hand to his mouth in disbelief. But even as the entire city mourns the death of a hero, and as Miles is inspired by MJ's eulogy, he struggles immensely to make the stride necessary to become the hero that the city needs. He has nobody to help guide him, and he has his own mental blocks when it comes to his father's expectations of him. But the great thing about this film is that Miles isn't just sent the people who he needs to help him through this journey, he sent people who also need him in their own journeys. Both Peter B. Parker and Gwen Stacy guide Miles through so much of his journey becoming Spider-Man, all while Miles helps them overcome their own fears and insecurities. Peter B. Parker is an older, more experienced, but also more jaded Spider-Man. He's lost Aunt May, and he and MJ have been divorced. She wanted kids, and, and it scared me. I'm pretty sure I broke her heart. Gwen Stacy comes from a universe where she was bitten by the spider, and she wasn't able to save her own best friend, Peter Parker. And I don't do friends anymore just to avoid any distractions. So while these are more fully realized spider people, they still struggle with their own traumas. And even though Peter B is not instantly a great teacher, he slowly warms up to Miles. When the pair get to Alchemax to steal the data about the collider, Peter goes in alone. But when Miles sees Kingpin is there, he goes in after him. He watched Kingpin kill Spider-Man once, and he's not going to do it again. Most people I meet in the workplace try to kill me, so... You're a nice change of pace. But even as he starts to warm up, Peter continues to try to fight Doc Ock solo, urging Miles to escape, paralleling his desire to do things by himself in his real life, a fear that involving others will get them hurt, a fear that is stopping him from wanting a kid with MJ. But as Miles fights for his life, escaping Alchemex, and finally getting the hang of swinging, Peter starts to feel a sincere sense of pride in his teaching him. I'm proud of us! Through his guidance of Miles, Peter starts to see the value in teaching someone, in passing his life experience, Experience in helping someone overcome obstacles to become a better, more equipped person. He starts to see the value in being a parent. Miles also shows Gwen the empathy she's been missing by avoiding friendships. I'm sorry about your friend. Thanks, Miles. And in turn, Gwen opens up a bit and returns the empathy he's been sorely needing since he developed his powers. I know how hard this is to have to figure this stuff out on your own. 
It's kind of nice not being the only spider person around. And these newly formed relationships start to give Miles the confidence to do what needs to be done, as they meet some new spider people who all need to get home before the collider can be destroyed. Unfortunately, none of them are convinced that Miles is capable of doing the job. He knows what he has to do, but he still hasn't overcome his mental blocks about being who he wants to be, in part due to his father's expectations. And this is immediately showcased in the next sequence. Even as Miles is struggling through one of the most bafflingly difficult trials anyone could possibly imagine. While his parents are desperately calling him to make sure he's okay, he's too afraid to answer their calls. He's too afraid to go to his father with this big of a problem out of fear of how he'll react. And instead, he goes to Aaron's and he starts to leave a note. You're the only one I can talk to. The one person Miles feels he can talk to about what he's going through is Aaron, which makes the following event all the more earth-shattering as he learns that Aaron is the Prowler, someone who has actively tried to kill him over the course of this movie. How can you even describe how devastating this must have been? The one place of comfort Miles felt he had left is actually out to get him. But obviously Aaron cares more about his nephew than his job, and when he realizes this kid is Miles, he refuses to move forward with Kingpin's orders, leading to his own murder at Kingpin's hand and Miles' Uncle Ben moment. Aaron's dying words to Miles show exactly why they had a connection and why Miles was comfortable with him. He tells him that he let him down. You're the best of all of us, Miles. You're on your way. Just... Keep going. Aaron knows Miles is a good kid and that he's on the right path, an encouragement that Miles doesn't get from his father, which is made worse by the fact that immediately after this, Jeff puts out an APB on the new Spider-Man. The following stretch is probably the best in the entire movie. As Miles lets out his anger over the loss of his uncle, fully feeling responsible for what happened, his new Spidey friends relate to him. This scene is not only an incredible piece of storytelling within the narrative, as everyone is there for Miles when he needs it most, but a celebration of the realities of the Spider-Man mythos. The sad understanding that this great responsibility is born of tragedy. You wouldn't understand. Miles, we're probably the only ones who do understand. And sadly, in this state, not even Peter B. believes that Miles is capable of destroying the Collider once they all find their way back to their home universes. At his absolute lowest, Miles is brought even lower. Peter begs Miles to show him he's capable of using his abilities but he isn't ready. He hasn't overcome his fears yet. And as he goes, Peter leaves Miles with his last piece of advice about when he'll know he's ready. You won't. It's a leap of faith. That's all it is, Miles. A leap of faith. And this leads to the most emotional scene in the entire film, and the crux of Miles' arc. As Miles is webbed up in his room, Jeff comes to see him and talks to him through the door. Jeff is also reeling from the loss of his brother, and the regret that they drifted apart before his death. And I don't want that to happen to us, okay? Through Jeff's realization that he and his brother drifted apart, implicitly because of his own expectations that he foisted on Aaron, he realizes that he's in danger of allowing this to happen to his son as well. And so he changes his approach. He gives Miles the encouragement to be his own person. I see this, this spark in you. It's, it's amazing. It's why I push you, but... It's yours. Jeff tells Miles that no matter what, he believes in him and that his drive, his passion, his abilities, they're his to use. Whatever you choose to do with it, you'll be great. And in a full circle moment, he shows that he's changed through his actions. I love you. You don't have to say it back though. Earlier in the movie, he forced Miles to say, I love you back. But now he knows that it isn't his place, that it's something Miles has to do on his own. And that validation and acceptance from his father is what Miles needed to move past that mental block, to allow himself to be the hero he needs to be. This is when Miles becomes Spider-Man, his own Spider-Man. Earlier in the movie, when Miles looks up at the Spidey suit, his eyes sit below Spidey's head, showing he wasn't ready to take up the mantle. Now in this sequence, his eyes match up perfectly. He designs his own suit with the flair found in his own art. Miles climbs the absolute tallest building he can, and in his head we hear the encouragement that he got from his father, from his uncle, and from Peter as he takes his leap of faith. And as Miles swings through New York, we see how he has become his own Spider-Man, fully in tune with himself, incorporating way more running into his swinging than we see from any of the other Spider-People, as he teased earlier in the film. Miles is Spider-Man, and he's ready to save Brooklyn. 
And before the big finale, we're also treated to one more little scene showcasing Peter and Gwen's respective struggles. As they sneak through the gala honoring the fallen Spidey, Peter B sees MJ and can't help himself but try to apologize to her, expecting that he will never get a chance to say it to his own MJ. And while it's touching to see Peter relay his deepest feelings, I almost feel more for Gwen here as she tries her hardest to help him realize that this is not the same person he loves. Trust me, I've been there. You gotta move on, buddy. Peter doesn't even realize that the best friend that Gwen lost was an alternate Peter Parker, and that she has been forced to spend all of this entire time with a living reminder of her biggest, deepest regret. The final stretch of this movie is where every single arc ties up so beautifully. As all of the spider people fight for their lives in the collider, Doc Ock wraps up Peter and things look grim. But of course, this is when our hero shows up and Doc knows exactly who that is. Spider-Man? On his return, Miles is immediately seen as Spider-Man, even by his biggest enemies. He has fully made the transition. He is Spider-Man. He saves Peter, whose excitement shows exactly how his arc has come full circle as well. I love you! I'm so proud of you! <laughs> Do I want kids? Miles saves Gwen from getting sucked into the collider, once more showing her that friends aren't a bad thing to have. And after Miles, Gwen, and Peter all tag team and defeat Doc Ock perfectly in sync, Miles steals the override key and miraculously swings up to the top of the collider. Now we taught him that, right? I didn't teach him that. And you definitely didn't. The person who actually taught Miles this was this universe's Peter. The way Miles swings up perfectly parallels the way we see Peter swing up to the top of the collider in the beginning of the movie. And it's Miles fulfilling his promise to Peter to swing up and destroy the collider. But it also makes good on Peter's promise to the audience in the opening sequence, even after his death. I always find a way come back. And as Miles sends off the rest of the Spidey people, who all get really great emotional send-offs, we see Gwen complete her arc for the film. Friends? Friends. And then we get the full completion of Peter B's arc, in the most satisfying way imaginable. As Miles takes on his own responsibility to get everyone home, Peter is ultimately scared to return because he doesn't want to blow it again with MJ. But Miles relays the same lesson Peter taught him in the exact same way. You won't. I hate to leave the faith. And now, as this universe's one and only Spider-Man, Miles shows that he's got the goods, taking on Kingpin himself, but he isn't actually doing it alone. As Kingpin beats down on Miles, he sees his father looking up at him from the control room, telling Spider-Man to get up. And with his father's encouragement, and with his uncle's lesson, Miles prevails. Hey. As soon as he saves the day, Miles calls his dad, and they mourn the loss of Aaron together. And Jeff shows once again how he has changed his attitude towards Miles over the course of the movie. And uh, you could um, throw up some of your art. And Miles, albeit in Spidey garb, finally says it back. I love you. <laughs> Wait, what? It's an absolutely perfect script, tying together every single character's arc into its final act in a complete and satisfying way. It is such an incredibly well done film that not only beautifully introduced a new Spider-Man to countless people who didn't know him, but celebrated the legacy and history of Spider-Man. And I think the biggest way it celebrated Spider-Man was through its biggest theme in its final lesson. Anyone can wear the mask. You could wear the mask. This idea stems back to an important quote from Spider-Man's co-creator, the great Stan Lee, who said, what I like about the costume is that anybody reading Spider-Man in any part of the world can imagine that they themselves are under the costume. And that's a good thing. And that is exactly what Miles had to reconcile with over the course of this film. He struggled with the idea that he was lucky enough to get into his fancy school through the lottery. But a lottery exactly parallels Miles getting bitten. That spider bite was a cosmic lottery. It didn't make him Spider-Man. Because what you choose to do with opportunity is what defines you. As MJ said in her eulogy for Peter, anybody could have gotten bitten by that spider. Peter didn't ask for his powers, but he chose to be Spider-Man. And you don't have to be bitten by a spider to be a hero. In our own way, we are all Spider-Man, and we're all counting on you. They're counting on me. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this Into the Spider-Verse video. I'm sure most of you have seen Across the Spider-Verse by now. Yeah, it's amazing. I'll have a video on it next week. Look forward to that. Until then, maybe check out some of my previous Spider-Man retrospectives. All right, peace. Johnny!